think conflict's a pretty good word. I think it can be really healthy and constructive. It's a really interesting analogy. <laughs> I've never heard a phrase like that. We're kind of married in our own weird way. Shared values. What's your personal favorite media format? Mm -hmm. I want to try to solve Google Analytics for podcasts. We just needed to find the right content creator creators. How do you define authenticity, especially when you mentioned ghostwriters as well, people using AI? A lot of time and energy into those other things so that I can show up as my best self. Hey guys, welcome back to Funds and Founders. Today we have on Becca. Becca has had various roles as a customer success manager and account manager. Uh, you were at The Hustle for three to four years, mm -hmm. where I think towards the end you were the general manager at The Hustle. You were at Market Hire as a newsletter advisor for a year or two before starting your own company called Workweek, where you're the current co-founder and COO. Welcome to the show. Awesome, thank you. We know that YouTube retention drops after four to five minutes. <laughs> what do you want to plug? Where can people reach out? What do you want them to know? Check out workweek.com. And um, really what we do is lift up voices of content creators in specific verticals. So if you're in HR, healthcare, um, fintech, e-com, um, marketing in general, check out one of our creators. They're amazing and go follow them. Sweet. And we'll plug again at the end. Cause, okay, cool. <laughs> but um one thing I like asking and starting with is, where do you think your entrepreneurial journey started? Ooh, interesting question. Um, I grew up in a house with an entrepreneur, and so it always felt like it was on the table. But going the traditional college route, going kind of the traditional job route, I didn't think it was something that I would end up doing. And um, things really took a turn during the pandemic in a good way. Um, working with one of my best friends who I'd been working with at The Hustle. Um, his name is Adam Ryan. He's my co-founder at Workweek. And um, he's a big swings kind of guy, extremely entrepreneurial. And um, collaborating with him really, really brought that out in me. And it's been a lot of fun kind of jumping in with both feet. Um, kind of in the middle of 2021 is when we got started. And yeah, not something I expected to be doing completely, but really happy I found myself here. What's one of the biggest changes you've seen? So, for example, you were at a hustle for three to four years mm -hmm. versus starting your own thing. Now, I don't know if hustle was super startup-y or super scrappy or super mm -hmm. organized, but what's the difference in working for someone having a leadership role versus running your own thing? Because I think there are nuances to running a company that people just miss. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, the hustle was very startup scrappy. We were bootstrapped. It was an incredible education in bootstrapping a business and like how that works. Um, and it was really inspiring to see the founders of the hustle do that, um, as well as working with Adam there. I think in jumping in to work week, the very first thing that Adam and I did, um, we were working together a lot during the pandemic, just like meeting up outside coffee shop kind of thing. And, um, as we started kind of talking about what we'd like to do, the very first thing we did was sit down and write out our core values and our operating principles. We didn't have a name for the business. We didn't know what kind of business we were going to build. We were talking about all sorts of different things based on trends and things we were seeing. But we really sat down and, and wrote out like our values. Who do we want to be and like who do we want to work with and how do we want to work together is what we were trying to get out of it. And that document is still shown to every single person who interviews with us and joins the team today. Um, and so I think that that big difference is, of course, there's so much more pressure, um, self-inflicted, but more pressure. You know, you're putting your heart and soul into this thing in a in a way that you might not quite be doing if it's not your business. Um, although one of our values is having an owner attitude, and I think we're two people who would do that anywhere that we we are. Um, but yeah, I think maybe the big difference is there is kind of like more passion to grind on another level and then also really getting to, for better or for worse, lead the culture um, and build a team in um, a way that you really want to to build it out and work with people for a long time. So I think that that like cultural nuance is something that really sticks out to me. You talk a lot about working with Adam and making sure you're aligned with him and his mm -hmm. working principles, right? What's your take on having a good co-founder relationship? And I think you briefly touched upon it, but for folks listening, what's your recommendation on going through that process and vetting and reaching to a point where you know it's the right person and kind of person to work with? Mm -hmm. And 
the idea comes second or where do you lie on that spectrum? Yeah. I I feel like I, I cheated. Um, I just ended up working with one of my best friends. So, you know, I don't think either, neither of us went through the process of like vetting but, out yeah. a co-founder, um, have certainly gone through the process of vetting out um, key leaders in the company. But for me, it really does come down to in any relationship, friendship, romantic, co-founder, we're kind of married in our own weird way, of uh, shared values. And I think, um, is this someone you want to spend a lot of time with? Do you guys value the same things? And really doing that list of shared values. We had known each other for you know, five, six years at that nice. point. Now we've been um, working together for seven going on eight years. And we knew each other really well, love spending time together, and really had a clear understanding of what each person valued. And so that I think through any conflict, through any challenge, we know we're swimming in the same direction and we, we care about each other. Nice. Yeah. How do you guys handle conflict? I, I don't want, conflicts is not a good word, but how do you guys handle disagreements with yeah. making decisions and do you want to go route X, route Y? Do you guys have areas you guys handle or how is that divvied up amongst the both yeah. of you? I, I think conflict's a pretty good word. Um, I, I think it can be really healthy and constructive and we... As far as, as conflict goes, I think most of it for us, like we don't have like big yelling matches or anything. Um, we really spend a lot of time, our desks are side by side, we have a whiteboard behind us, and we have a lot of like end of the day, just whiteboarding sessions or weekend whiteboarding sessions and just spending time together and bringing the leaders that we've brought onto the team um, into the room with us to like just jam and be open. And I think maybe the, the underlying take on that is Approaching everything with open-mindedness and curiosity, letting people be heard, not being afraid to go down rabbit holes and just like thought, mentally explore things. No idea is a bad idea, and we kind of start from that nice. that place and spend a lot of time just exploring and talking together. Um, even if one of us might have a direction in mind, we really like take the time to open it up and, and dive in. Nice. And you encourage your whole, all your team members to do the same as well. And like that sort of shared across the board. Yeah. I hope it feels really infused across the board, but definitely shared. And, um, I think one of the most, uh, important things to me is curiosity okay. and bringing on people who I think are a lot better and smarter than me at the things that they're doing and the niches that they're in. Something Adam and I have talked about a lot is how can we, work together with people we really enjoy working with for a long time. Um, and a big part of that is giving people autonomy and hiring people to do things that they're really great at doing. Um, I definitely think our head of marketing is way better at marketing memberships than I will ever be. He's probably forgotten more than I'll, I'll know. So how can we just approach things with a really open mind, ask a lot of questions, um, and foster that is, is something I think about a lot. Nice. It's a really interesting analogy. He's forgotten more than I'll ever know. <laughs> I've never heard a phrase like that. Yeah, it's. I think about that one a lot, and I think there are a lot of people on the team who um, I've just been blown away by their experience nice. and where they've specialized, and so I feel feel really grateful. Nice. Going back to the start of your journey, you mentioned you guys knew each other, you're working together, you aligned on values, operating principles. From that point to starting work week. How long did that take? How many ideas did you guys go through? What was that journey to like, oh, we're gonna do work weekend, here's what it is? Yeah, it was pretty fast. We, so Adam and I obviously had worked together at The Hustle for a couple of years. Um, and both kind of in 2020 went to do different things. I joined Marketer Hire and they were interested at the time in building potentially a media arm. Okay. And we were exploring that and that's kind of why I joined that team. Um, and Adam went into the VC world um, and was learning that side of the table. And in the spring of 2020, maybe like March, April, we were starting to just get more coffees, work together, and started to talk about like, what, what do we, like, what is the culture? What do we love? What do we want to do? What are things we would look for? Um, and that was 2021. And so at that time, like things like the buzzwords, like the creator economy were popping up and we were talking about um, B2B media more than usual. Um, and we had obviously spent a lot of time learning like newsletters and building audiences and what content to commerce looks like in B2B and B2C. And so we had a lot of these things that we've been talking about, but I would say between like March or April is when we first started talking, maybe we built like a financial model sometime in May when we were like, okay, the very first thing we did actually, we, I think we still even have a domain for something called the sales circle. 
And we were like, okay, we know how to build a B2B media company. We'll do it. We have sales experience. I can create the content. Adam can run the model. We can sell some stuff. It'll be great. And then as we step back, we're like, we could do this for every vertical. Um, and everyone that we know is looking for someone they trust with insight um, in the specific role that they're in um, or industry that they're in. And um, you know, how do we how do we build this playbook and run it across many things? And so I think in July of 2021, I, I left Marketer Hire and went full time at Workweek and haven't looked back since. It's been about three years. Nice. Yeah. And the the reason I ask is folks I don't know if analysis paralysis is the right mm. word to use, but ideas are dime a dozen, right? So you guys thought about creator economy, newsletter, you have all these thoughts going on. What's the process to go from that to here's our B2B content playbook and like what work week ended up happening? Was it just intuition? Did you guys have idea? Was there a particular insight that you mm -hmm. saw where you're like, oh no, like let's go down deep here. Like how did you go from this bubble to yeah. like, here's the playbook. We felt really, I think maybe one, one thing underlying all of this is we felt really confident in our ability to build B2B newsletters. Okay. And so we maybe, maybe like too confident, but we felt really confident in our ability to build a B2B newsletter business. And we just needed to find the right content creator creators. Got it. And then I think what, we really honed in on in that time where we were going back and forth of, do we do this one vertical and we have like multiple sales newsletters covering, you know, different types of sales or different functions within sales, or do we go into different industries or different categories? Um, something that we saw and what we ended up dubbing the knowledge expert paradox was that in a lot of business media, there are a lot of people creating content who have never done the job because yep. the unit economics never made sense. And so, and there's a great place for journalists and people covering B2B. It's not that that shouldn't exist. We just saw a really interesting opportunity where if we could figure out how to partner with a B2B influencer, essentially, I don't, I, that's not like exactly what we would say, <laughs> yeah. but um, I think people can kind of get that one. A B2B content creator, how could we partner with someone who actually has been boots on the ground at the know. thing that they're doing um, and find a way to make it make sense for them to create full time and we can plug it across this like bigger business model. And so that was that was the the leap that we took. And um, it was an interesting one to take and one that has has been working out really well and, and been a really exciting thing jumping in with particular these ex knowledge experts on their niche and building out from there. Nice. Just a quick sidebar on that. I, I have a lot of conversations with folks who are like, oh, I'm a thought leader on X and I write on this. And part of me is like, you've only been doing this for like a year. Yeah. Even if you have, right? It's like everyone selling an e-com course, it doesn't really know e-com that well. Maybe some do, but most of them are just yeah. selling courses. And I just fundamentally have a problem with, unless you've done it for 15, 20 years, I don't think you truly under, you know nuances. I'm not saying you don't know the skill. But to be like, hey, I'm a, like, I really know the subject. I'm like, I don't think that's true. But um, I just don't like the term thought yeah. leader. I, I feel my... like the thought leader term is something that's bothered me. I feel like everyone's a coach. And I'm like, how, who are you coaching? Like, you're in your 20s. Like, I, yeah. need, I want some, someone who's, like, done this for 20 yeah, years to yeah. help me figure out what to do. But, yeah, I think that was something that really stood out to us. There are so many of these, like, gurus and thought leaders yeah. who are just – saying a lot of fluffy stuff and where we've really leaned in is maybe some some folks have 15 20 years of experience that we're working with some might be closer to like 10 but it's people who really have had at least 10 solid years diving deep into something that they're doing and we're really excited about connecting with people and helping people get better at their jobs and that's that's what we've been doing nice um, i don't know i saw a twitter post the other day where someone's like i'm looking for a mentor and then he's like 60 plus has had a marriage, this yeah. successful business. And it's like, that's the kind of mentor I want is mm -hmm. someone who's been through the journey that I want to be on, not someone who's learned how to coach, right? Yeah. Um, but no, that makes sense. So you guys decide the playbook, the 
B2B creator, knowledge expert angle. How, what's your plan of attack? Do you know people in the space? Are you picking a vertical? Are you going all verticals? Like what's step two after that? Yeah, well, when we started, um, it was definitely a lot of just trying things out. And so I would say like, as I kind of look back, 2021 was, we launched the business in November of 2021. We're like, okay, let's, we know how to go build some newsletter businesses, let's do it. And when I kind of left my job to go on on work week, Adam and I figured it would take us like three or four months to find three or four content creators to start working with. And it took like three or four weeks. And we, we it was really all from Twitter. We were looking and finding people who were um, already content creators. At that time, most of those folks didn't have large audiences. One, um, Nick Sharma did. And so we kind of worked with a couple of a couple of different people. And then over the course of 2022, I think, um, in 2023, 2022 was really building out these newsletter businesses. 2023 was testing the intention of those audiences. And um, what we kind of learned over time is, you know, where we could leverage advertising upfront would help us build the business bigger down the line. And so we started kind of launched with a lot of different creators, tried a bunch of different things. I think at one point had like 16 different brands under the Workweek house. And then over the course of 2023, we had a lot of learnings by that time, a lot of data analysis, a lot of great people, but just had learnings about kind of where we could use our model the best. Um, and so now, right now we're at about like eight brands under the Workweek umbrella. And um, as and we, oh Just yeah. to clarify, when you say brands, you mean expert and their audience and whatever they're, is that what you mean by brand yeah. or? Yeah. So each of our brands, if, if Workweek is a house of brands, each of our brands, we work with a creator who's the face of that brand and Got is it. the content creator leading that brand. Got it. Um, but there are a bunch of people working to build things out kind of around them and around that content. So more holistically, I'd call it a brand Got and that includes sense. our um, the media business, so newsletter, social media, brand partnerships with that, but also um, we're building memberships or communities, online communities for each of these brands too. Nice. Yeah. Um, and so as we look to expand into different verticals in the future, where we're really interested is how can we find a space that um, we can understand what the total addressable market is, we can understand um, kind of a need of a particular customer profile within that addressable market and then go capture that. Um, and obviously looking at things like, you know, do newsletters exist in that space? Is there already an expert in that space? Like what's the competition like? So on and so forth. But um, really looking at what are kind of big markets in the U.S. Um, things that we're in already are like HR. And so we have a brand called I Hate It Here because a lot of HR leaders hate their jobs. Um, the content creator we work with is incredible. Her name is Hiba Youssef. Um, she just got featured in the New York Times talking nice. about how HR people hate their jobs this past week. Um, and so we've been kind of looking at that space. How many director level plus HR leaders are there in the US um, or in North America more generally? And so looking at kind of roles and in industries where we can narrow in on things like that and then go seek to capture part of that market. Makes sense. And so is the model at that point, you have a brand, you have a face of the brand. Mm -hmm. Now this brand is meant to attract some segment of B2B folks who mm -hmm. align with that brand. And so do you want to, is the business model make money through advertisements for the right product and then eventually put them into a community, which then will also be monetized is my understanding, right? Yeah. So generally speaking, where we start, it's exactly that. We start with um, media we have a great brand partnerships team and work to sell across newsletters, social media, custom content. And then over time, as we build that audience to a certain scale, look to connect the people within that audience on a deeper level yep. through building an online community where they join an annual subscription and, and we bring them together. But I would say another thing that we saw, kind of the flip side of Maybe not the flip side, but the kind of two sides of the coin of our business. One side is knowledge expert content creators, um, and the other is looking to solve on a more human level. Is how can we, um, if we know how to build a media business and we're working with these amazing content experts and knowledge experts, how can we use that to really serve bringing people together and helping people have fun while they're learning how to be better at their job? Makes sense. What's an interesting insight that you've seen? If you just want to take an example of one of the brands of something that happens within the community inside that's just lesser known. So like if you think about HR stuff, mm -hmm. what's happening with that HR community? How are they helping each other? That's yeah. just that was an insight or unlock for you. 
it's been really incredible to see. I think the the thing that I look for when we want to launch a community, and I feel like that word can be so overused today, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> but when we launch a community, even on the newsletter side, as we're sort of building out that audience, it's are people self-organizing? Okay. Are people kind of reaching out on social media or if we start like a free kind of Slack channel or something, are they saying like, hey, I'm gonna be at this HR conference too, do any of you guys wanna meet up? Um, and so once we launched the membership for I Hate It Here, and it's called Safe Space, um, we saw that community, the insight really is like, how much are they self-organizing? Is there this organic spark that, is, is this real? Is this a real community or not? Are people just putting like the label community yeah, on it? Yeah. And um, that organic spark is what we're looking for in anything we start and any experiment we have. And it's been really wild to see. Like there have been, we have a content library feature in our membership. We built our own memberships platform. Um, and I think it's, it's maybe one of the best, if not the best um, community platforms that exist right now. It's so cool. But we have this content library feature and a collaboration tool within that where we weren't sure how many people were going to use it, but um, would people start creating knowledge expert content together without our content creators, without the people who are the face of the brand and um, or in collaboration with them? And the big answer is yes. And it's been really wild to see. There have been these like 100 page guides that 15 different HR leaders collaborate on to build. There have been like events where people are like, oh, I'm just going to be here. Does anyone want to have a breakfast or do yoga in New York? Nice. Um, and so I think that stuff, you know, it's not, it probably sounds a little bit obvious, but I think it's really cool to see people collaborate to make work content just for fun. Um, it's a cool thing to witness. I think it's also breaking the barrier, right? So I think just being that community or newsletter is you have one common touch point with all of these folks that would be very hard to develop outside of that. So I think that that itself is a really big value add. Even if you don't facilitate as much, people who want to do it, they just need that one like yeah. icebreaker connection and they'll take it from there. There's this that really inspired us um, called Doximity. Yeah, and for doctors, yeah. Yeah, well, and yeah, yeah, I guess you would know. Um, most people don't, Every a lot, of, like nine times out of 10, people are like, what is that? Um, but I realized the name, somewhere I was reading the name came from Doctors in Proximity. Got because it. it's a big challenge for doctors. If you're like a foot and ankle specialist in yeah. Philadelphia, what was the way to go talk to someone at your level in another place easily? And so they really brought people together and they vetted people coming onto the platform. You had to upload your credentials to get yeah. there so you knew you were legit. And like creating that icebreaker and creating that touch point um, turn into a really big business. And so that for us has been something that we look at as um, we can do something really cool by bringing people together virtually. And then I'm really excited over time to be able to do that more and more in person nice. as well. You know, there's one for nurses as well. Oh, what's it called? I don't know. I'll have to look it up, but there's one for doctors, one for nurses. I love it. Do you know how Doximity got doctors on the platform? Tell me. So they made profile pages for every doctor, mm -hmm. shitty profile pages. <laughs> Worst okay. picture they could scrape in accurate, like, history, but they're just scraping. They're not, like, putting effort into knowing which college you went to and whatever. And they'd make all these profiles, and they're ranking on SEO. Like, I think programmatic SEO. When you would search a name, you'd see your Doximity page. Like, oh, this is a shitty page, and there's a like, claim your page button right there. So that was a really... I don't know if it was the biggest reason. It was a big reason why doctors started making their Doximity profiles is... Well, that's a shitty photo of me and it's ranking like top 10 in Google. Like I don't want that. Yeah. I love that. Um, so it's an interesting customer acquisition Definitely that I've read about. Yeah. yeah. That's a really interesting story. You talk about letter brand. What other media formats are you guys exploring outside of newsletter and, um, community? Yeah. We've built at this point a pretty standard playbook. And so, um, when, Newsletters are definitely the foundation of our business. Um, but with that, we almost always, within a certain period of time, will launch a podcast as well. Um, and then explore social media depending on what feels most relevant to that knowledge expert and the space that they're in. And so, for example, um, the 
HR brand. I hate it here. There are, of course, a ton of HR folks on LinkedIn. Um, but the type of content that Hibba is creating and the type of content we have hits really, really well on Instagram and TikTok. On the, on, as a different example, we have a healthcare brand um, led by a guy named Blake Madden, who's incredible. Um, it's healthcare analysts and strategists and finance folks um, called Hospitology. Um, none of them are on Instagram. <laughs> you know, he's not, he's not going to go meet anyone there. Um, and maybe a podcast won't hit as well, but virtual events where people can go on and join and experience a panel and do that, do that like once a month is something that works really, really well. And so kind of the stack that we have is newsletters that are the foundation. We'll add and layer in social, some type of social depending on where the, the professionals are. Um, and then we'll start doing things like virtual events, really casual to start and then ramp them up into something um, a little bit more formal as we go. And over time, really use that as a channel to pull people into the community that we launch. Um, and eventually, um, we'd love to be able to, and we already have started adding some professional products and services kind of at the bottom of that pyramid for folks in the community, but also to sell back to audiences. Nice. And so we have a, a vertical software business and franchising for one of our brands. We have a recruiting business, and that's something we'd love to be able to support across every community is, are you hiring? Like, we can help you with that. Nice. Pretty cool. What's your personal favorite media format? I love newsletters. I feel like it'd be criminal if I said anything else at this point. Um, but I really love newsletters. I think it's such a, um, there's a reason this industry has blown up in the past, you know, 10 years especially. And um, I think it's just such a personal connection you can feel with someone. Um, in the same way, I think like so many people listen to podcasts. I'm just more of a reader, but yeah. I love podcasts as well. And when you listen to a podcast enough, um, as we've seen out in the world, like people really feel like they know this yeah. person and it's so personal. And your inbox is kind of a uniquely personal space too. Um, and so whoever is letting us into their inbox is a really big deal. And um, also the ability to, I think, learn from actions that people are taking in a newsletter is really powerful and it can we can help it can help us create better content for them and so i know with podcasting i don't know how much data we're able to get in and out on like very listening, little. right no. and yeah so like i know that it's very little and so it's like i don't know what else we'll be able to find we might be able to like shout a code and see who comes from this code or like see who lands there but with the newsletter you can really see what people are interested in and what they want more of and then keep serving them more of that and it's a really i think really powerful in that way too someday Someday. I want to try to solve Google Analytics for podcasts. Like I, yeah. if someone can solve that, I've looked. I don't think I'm not aware of a technical way to actually do this. So something has yeah. to change for this to work. But there's a really cool. Uh, there's a guy. His name's Brian Barletta, and he's running a B2B brand called Sounds Profitable on like the business of podcasting. And I know this is something he. I'm sure he wants to solve. So worth following. Okay, yeah. sweet. What's a lesser known insight about newsletters that you've seen or learned over the years? Something that folks don't talk about as much. Trying to, I'm, and then one of those things of like fear of being obvious. I'm like, what do people not talk about so much? I think maybe it's obvious, um, but something that feels really critical to us is in as like the newsletter industry was kind of re-emerging or emerging in a really huge way, 2015, 16, 17, it was like a race to size. And how many people can we acquire? How cheaply can we acquire them? How do we keep them on the list? Um, and let's have these newsletters of millions of people. And that that works to an extent. But then, um, you know, we've reached this point where people have a lot of newsletters in their inboxes. Not everyone can keep building um, the next morning brew, right? And so... I'm surprised you didn't say the next house. Well, you know, I was trying to give everybody a little credit. Um, and and morning brew is incredible in what they've built as well and, and have you know, millions yeah. of people. And... Um, what we've been really focused on is um, going niche. And I think the biggest learning that we have is really focusing almost at all costs on finding the right people. Yeah. And we've put a lot of effort um, and resources into doing research on addressable market, doing the research on who's out there in the world that fits that market, um, and really narrowing in an ideal, a fairly narrow ideal customer profile for each of our brands so that like some of our newsletters might never have more than 100 or 200,000 people on them because that's all that exists. Um, 
And so what we're really focused on is kind of finding these narrow, narrowing these ICPs and finding people that fit them rather than going and expanding and building a really wide newsletter audience. Um, especially in B2B and the partnerships we're trying to build. It's great for ad partners. It's great for content creators. We're like, who's the one person we're writing for and we're and building for, and we can do that. And I think it enables a lot of focus. And I, I think down the line, hopefully, um, is very economically efficient too. Nice. In the ad space, our B2B focused podcasts from an ad perspective more lucrative than just a general B2C newsletter? On the average, definitely, yeah. Um, obviously, they're like the Joe Rogans and yeah, stuff of the yeah. world, but I think that that goes across any medium. Um, the folks who are the software companies who are willing to pay a couple of hundred dollars per customer for an acquisition cost, um, you know, it's a lot more. They'll pay and are able to pay a lot more than someone trying to 100%. go find someone to buy jeans. Yeah. So yeah, it's a big part of why Adam and I have leaned into the B two B space too. We saw that as an opportunity, yeah. but. Um, he comes from a background in business media, was at a company called Spiceworks okay. um, in Austin that um, was a big inspiration for us as well. And um, they were building a media company for IT professionals. And so it's just, I think, a really interesting thing to help these business, these software businesses and businesses in general. Everyone's kind of building a podcast, hiring a ghostwriter. We're looking at yeah. all this stuff. We're just building the media brand that they can plug into. Nice. Uh, have you heard of Turpentine? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And so I think they have a similar thesis. I think they're going podcast first. Like they're building podcast brands mm -hmm. for VC and CTO and CFO yeah. and CEO and stuff. So similar thesis. I think I heard about Industry Dive mm -hmm. being acquired for like 500 million plus. Mm -hmm. And it tells you how valuable someone with a really set vision and intention is, right? Because they had... I don't know how many industries, but very few si small sizes per industry. Mm -hmm. But when you amass it, it becomes a really valuable audience, right? Yeah. Because even if there's 10 people, but they're doing like million dollar deals, those 10 people are a lot more valuable than 100,000 people buying $5 items, right? Exactly. Um, industry Dive was a huge inspiration for us, still is. Another company, Aging Media, okay. is all about, is a media company with a couple of different verticals. And I think a, a relative to like what most people think, like a relatively very small subscriber base. Um, but every single one of those subscribers was so valuable because they're reaching exactly who um, who they want to reach. And that's that's our thesis as well. Nice. When you're going verticals, are you ever worried about, oh, is someone going to take this audience from us? Because let's say you have an e-com or HR tech or human, re um, not recruiters, what's the word I'm looking for? What's the word you used for Hiba Yusuf's audience? Oh, like HR. H yeah, 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 yeah. And so HR professionals. And so are you ever worried about there being other brands that cater to the same audience and now you're fighting for a much smaller pool? Or is that not a concern because you're building it in a way where even if there is churn, it doesn't matter? Yeah. I think competition is always something to look out for. Um, and also I'm just a big believer in abundant in an abundance mindset yeah. and um, there are so many people who can provide value. What I am focused on and, and like thinking about every day is how can we provide the most value to people um, and make sure we're providing great content. The more like niche we can get and building for like the right people and knowing that we're serving them really well, um, I'm just focused on what, nice. what we're doing. I think we can always learn from competition. I think there might even be cool ways to collaborate with other people at times. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm less worried about people stealing those audiences and more worried about us just like doing right by those audiences and Makes how do sense. we build the best thing for them. Makes sense. And so for your brands, you work with certain knowledge experts for each brand. Mm -hmm. The way it's structured, can that knowledge expert change over time? Let's say and they don't want to do this anymore. How are you positioning and building that? Because if you're building the brand's audience or if you're building that creator's audience, the creator can go and... Mm -hmm you've now lost all the audience. But how do you think about that sort of relationship with creators? Yeah, I mean, we probably obviously think about it a lot. And something that Adam and I said from the beginning, which might sound fluffy, but is really true, is we started this with the intention of doing it for a really long time. Um, we were like, what's something we could, in theory, do for the rest of our lives? And if we give ourselves really long time horizons, can we build something really big and really cool um, with people that we love? 
And so that has been our focus. And I think the way we've structured um, partnerships with creators, the way that we work together, it's all with the intention of working together for a really long time. Got it. That being said, um, of course, time goes on, people will come and go. Um, and we've experienced that to some extent already. Um, and I think the way, maybe the easiest way to share how we think about it is, um, you know, The Daily Show had Jon Stewart, then it had Trevor Noah, Jon Stewart's back, we'll see who's next. Um, of course, people are attached to this person and that's a beautiful thing and like why people are coming for this audience. But I think there's also an opportunity and another reason why we're focused on building a broader brand is um, when someone is ready to move on, we can kind of bring someone in to fit that audience and, and serve them as well. Pretty cool. Yeah. Um, the reason I ask is I feel like a lot of creators getting to the space of creating because of all the like glamour that comes with it. But when you get into like making content every day at some rhythm and cadence, it gets pretty mundane pretty fast and like the fun goes out of it. And so I've seen a lot of people like start, do a lot and they're like, I don't want to do this anymore. Right. Um, (laughs) And so that's why I asked because at that point, if you're building based off of a name and a face, it gets a lot harder to keep that going if that face doesn't want to be there, right? Yeah. Um, but it's probably a talent you guys will are actively figuring out as stuff goes on. Yeah, and we are focused for sure on building the brand around them too, and I think there's there's a balance there. But um, I would say the biggest focus I have is how can I support creators and what they're doing so that they are able to run the marathon, not the sprint, and it doesn't feel overwhelming. And so a lot of the work we do and resources we provide are on taking that kind of mundane lift off of folks so that they can really go enjoy the work that they're doing and feel inspired and connect with people in their industry. And typically everyone we work with is still in some capacity, like working on the thing that they're doing. Makes sense. Um, Yeah. What's so newsletter, podcast, community, what are some growth strategies that you're really excited about right now? We have such a standard playbook for growth. Um, and for growing newsletters. And I think something I'm really curious about and I feel like is this new world of testing is podcast growth. Um, and we have someone on our team who knows more about podcasting than I'll, has forgotten more about podcasting than I'll <laughs> remember. Um, his name's Ben and he is always testing different things, testing YouTube shorts, testing um, how, we, how we run it on social, testing different hooks and different ways of structuring episodes. And so um, I think... I don't know if I have like one particular strategy for any product that I'm like, oh, we're wildly testing this new thing. But I think what has been really cool and something that we've been thinking about a lot is how can we take the juice from kind of one piece of content if a creator is writing a newsletter. Often our creators are writing this like essay style newsletter that's really in depth, 2000 words, like whatever it is. How can we take that and turn it into something across all these channels that spins the wheel for everything? Um, and it's it like is one of those things that's like, yeah, of course you do that, but also kind of easier said than and than done. Then, and yeah. um, figuring out how to like efficiently build the big beautiful piece of furniture that is one podcast or one newsletter, and then run that across social and make sure it's like touched across across a bunch of different channels in an effective way. Um, is something that I'm, I've been thinking about about a lot and I'm excited to see, especially as we're testing more things like YouTube shorts and TikToks and, and just trying to like drive people into that top of funnel. It's interesting you say that because I've been doing this since December, the podcast. Mm-hmm. For the last three months, I've wanted to start a newsletter associated podcast, which is just, hey, here's like three fun things that happened in last week's episode. Yeah, Here's who's coming on. Here's some interesting things I saw this week. Yeah. Super basic. Like, I, I don't even want it to be very well written. I haven't been able to click send on that because I'm like, it has to look good. It has to, like, write well. And then, oh, I, I didn't review the last week's episode, so now I got to do it next week. There's all these, like, superficial things I add because it seems easy. Like, theoretically, it's easy. But when you talk about Content Engine, I'm like, it's so much work to then make a LinkedIn post, make an Instagram post. Like you want to grow the podcast. I don't it, like it, but it, I like this. I like the conversation. I like doing the episode. I don't like any of the post production. Like I despise it. That's but I it's think part of common. the yeah. But it's part <laughs> yeah. of the journey, right? It's part of the yeah. 
I got to figure out a funnel and a team and everything. But And also one of our, I think for what it's worth, one of our operating principles is hit publish, don't be perfect. Yeah. And I think we're obviously building this business and have folks who are taking all of that kind of bullshit off yeah. of someone like you um, because most people don't like the post-production side. They don't want to do that stuff. Um, so we're focusing on that. But also, especially as people are getting started and we're ramping up, it's like, just get it out there. People are excited to to hear and see what you have. And um, there's probably so much in so many smart people's brains that just doesn't go out into the world because, for that reason. So, yeah. yeah. You work a lot. You're building these brands. You're working with a lot of influencers knowledge experts um what do you think the importance of a brand is or some sort of influences for founders starting companies for people starting startups yeah i think it's incredibly important um and i know like everyone and their brother has a ghostwriter right now right um and there's a reason for that and a reason when you know, I joined Marketer Hire, they were thinking about and kind of exploring starting a, a media brand. It's like building top of funnel. Um, and so I think the more, especially as, it feels so obvious on the consumer side, um, Kylie and Cosmetics, Kim and Skims, like all these, all this like content to commerce feels really obvious because consumers are spending more and more time consuming content across every channel that's not just limited to a certain kind of uh, lane, the more you can create authentic content that connects with people around the problems you're solving in the business you're building, I think having that owned audience is is so powerful. Um, and I think about HubSpot was like kind of a leader in starting blogs and driving people to their, their site in that way. I don't know if I'm giving like a very clear answer to this, but Maybe the TLDR is, I think it's really important. And the more people can lean into building their own audiences, they're going to, of course, spend resources and time doing that. But I think at the end of the day, it will be a lot less than paying millions and millions in marketing. And, you know, I, I don't remember the benchmark off the top of my head, but there's some like pretty standard benchmark for SaaS companies who have done fundraising for what percentage of that fundraising. It's like a huge amount, I think like 30 plus percent or something that goes just like back into Facebook and Google uh, ads. Yeah. And what if you didn't have to do that? And so that's where we've really come from is, can we start with audiences and go the other way? Um, and I think more and more people are seeing value there. Do you know who Jay Hoovy is? Um, no. He's this YouTuber. He has a startup. He does like a one platform for people selling stuff online. So mm -hmm. like everything's Stripe, Shopify, like the whole thing in one, it's called stand.store. But he has a like a hundred k on YouTube, mm -hmm. and he just documents his journey of being a founder. He raised five million. Mm -hmm. He put his camera on when he was doing an update for his investors, and it's that whole journey. Yeah. And I think he's also the reason his company's at like fifteen, sixteen million ARR based on the last video he did. I think is partially because he has a really strong personal brand on YouTube. Now whether that's helping get AR or not, but it ha definitely has some influence in his SaaS product. I would wager a pretty big influence. And I think especially for founders who are like, they want to find a way to connect with the people who need their product, going out and saying even some of the most obvious stuff, a lot of people just aren't saying it. You know, Most people aren't creating content. Most people are just consuming it. And so I'm a big believer in, in creating content even if it's a little obvious. Um, I think uh, Caitlin Bourgeois on Twitter, I think about her tweet all the time. She tweeted something a long time ago that was like FOBO, like fear of being obvious. And I, and I, when we talk with our content creators a lot, it's like, say the obvious thing. Most people just aren't saying it at, at all. Yeah. And yeah, so I, I would wager that Jay is getting, driving a, probably a pretty significant portion of ARR, even if he can't attribute it um, yeah. back to his content. You mentioned being authentic and that's what consumers are looking for, right? How do you how do you define authenticity, especially when you mentioned ghostwriters as well? Mm -hmm. People are using AI. People are making AI clips that are not really them, but like <laughs> yeah. Gen AI versions of them. Do you have an opinion on what authentic means and where you draw the line, or does it just have to be something that I support and endorse, whether it's AI or me? Or yeah, I don't know if that's clear, but. I feel really strongly about being authentic. Um, 
And I think AI is an incredible tool to get more of yourself out there. Okay. Um, I think a ghostwriter is an incredible tool and partner to get more of yourself out there. I think the most important thing, maybe one of the first things I think about with authenticity, especially in the B2B world, is, again, maybe something obvious, but we're coming from previously, um, up until the past 10 years or so, 15 years, people wearing heels and suits and going to trade shows and khakis and polos and passing out business cards and you have to write really professionally and you you have like a very professional email and I know a friend who got like yelled at when they were 23 because they didn't properly order the CC list of people on the email enough. I can't imagine giving any like thought to that at yeah. this point. Yeah. Um, we're just entering, increasingly entering a world where you can be yourself at work, um, which is a little bit more casual. You can wear the clothes you want. You can talk the way that you want. We're not expecting, and I'm, there are plenty of people who still expect this, but I know in this like kind of startup world, at least that I'm I'm living in, um, you can really show up as your authentic self at work, and that's really encouraged, and it's increasingly encouraged. And so when I think about that authenticity with our content and creating content, it's instead of writing with a bunch of big buzzwords about synergy and blah, 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 whatever, we're, and people who have never done the job, we're working and creating content with someone who's been in your shoes, they've, they've done this thing, there's a level of authenticity there, they're gonna talk to you like you and I are talking and have a more casual and like human conversation. Yeah. I'm gonna talk to you like a person and talk to you like a friend. I'm not gonna be like, well, it's really nice to see you today. You know, it's like having like more authentic conversations, that can come through in content too. Um, and then, you know, I don't know how I feel about Gen AI versions of people. You might lose me there um, personally, but I think in general, just like it's great to leverage tools to get more of your ideas yeah. out into the world. And I have no hesitation around that. Okay. Um, I recently came across a tool called HeyGen where you can upload a video of yourself mm -hmm. and talking different angles and you can create still shots of like me sitting and like doing an ad read. But... I don't have to actually do that. Yeah. So I feel like those kinds of use cases I'm perfectly fine with. But the one problem, not problem, but like I feel like when a lot of people use ghostwriters in Gen AI, they're relying on those tools to even make the content. They're like, hey, just go write for me and like build an audience yeah. for me, right? But you want people to want to agree with your thoughts, not someone's thoughts about your topic. Because when you actually go interface, they're not gonna have that same like level of connection, but it's a gray area, I feel like. People are just well, building audiences, so. People are just building, yeah, it's like, I'm gonna build an audience, I'm gonna use AI to write this newsletter. I think at the end of the day, real humans are gonna see through that. And something else we've talked a lot about is like, curation is cheap. Anyone can curate the news, any AI tool at this point can curate the news, and that is needed. It's not that that's not needed, but where we go deeper and we're trying to build a really authentic community is we have people who are boots on the ground. They might be curating the news, but then they're giving their insight and they have a really unique Makes insight sense. because of their experience. And I think that's where AI can help us like clean up the copy, but it's never going to be able to have this human insight that you have from 15 years on the job. Makes sense. I like that. Towards the end, I like doing a couple questions yeah <laughs> i'm nervous what would you say has been your support system through your journey right uh building out hustle work week going from idea to eight brands now what's yeah. been your support system in this journey Question. i i just have such an amazing community of people um including Adam. I mean, I spend a lot of time with Adam and his wife and his kids, you know, like I, it's been a really fun ride because I've gotten to do it with someone. And so there have been times where he and I have looked at each other and been like, can you imagine doing this alone? This would suck. Like we would not have lasted this long. And so I think my support system, one, like definitely taking care of myself and trying to be really intentional about taking care of my mental health and physical health, but to just having a great community around me in Austin, in my family, um, and in the co-founder I'm working with, um, I don't, I, I wouldn't want to do this alone. Um, it's not, I don't think I'm a person, I really like thrive in partnership and it's been a really fun partnership to be in. Nice. What are three resources you'd recommend 
to someone listening who's starting out that have helped you through your journey? It can be anything. Resource yeah. could be whatever. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of. I think having a great business coach has been an incredible resource. You want to plug your coach? Or yeah. My, my coach's name is Peter Hill. and Peter sponsored this podcast. Yeah. Okay. Peter sponsored this podcast, buddy. Uh, talk, I'm talking to him in a couple hours, so I'll give him a shout. But Peter and Adam work together at The Hustle, so they've known each other for a while. And we started working with Peter almost Im- immediately upon starting work week. And we'll do kind of, um, we each meet with him once a month on our own. And then we meet with him once a month together. And I think that's been really powerful, nice. even for two, the two of us who feel really comfortable with disagreeing with each other and like going back and forth and having hard conversations. I think we're really comfortable with that with each other. But having someone be able to like facilitate and mirror feedback back and mirror things back is just so valuable. I think anyone, it was such a worthwhile investment even early on. Nice. Um, I think another resource, which might sound obvious or cheesy is, um, Adam and I committed to working out together. Um, he's been a little in and out, so I'll let him hear that on this (laughs) podcast too, but um, I'll get him back someday. We'll clip this and send this just (laughs) just for him. (laughs) But we dedicated a couple of hours a week to like physical fitness together. And some of our best conversations were happening during, during those sessions, but it just helped us like get out of our, get out of our brains and like stay healthy. And I don't think that can be underestimated. Um, I know a lot of people who get like in the grind, we're trying to run a marathon, not a sprint. So that's been really big for me. And I'm trying to think of something else. I really, again, another potentially cheesy one, but Brene Brown's book, Dare to Lead. I'm a big, I'm a Brene Brown stan. And I think also there are so many people who are incredibly smart. They tactically or technically know exactly how to build their business. And then you get to a certain point and it's a people business and you're managing people. Um, and so for me, really putting a lot of resources into things like therapy and coaching, but also just reading and learning, like how do we thoughtfully build this culture and how can I work with people for a long time has been a really big focus for me too. Nice. I like that. What's your startup tech stack? How do you run the company? And if you could go through like top to bottom, every tool, that'd be great, but depends on. Man, we have so many tools at this point. Um, wow, we have so many tools at this point. Um, I'll try and cover, cover some of the big ones. Um, sales side, we use the sales team has more tools than I'm even aware of. And I don't, I don't oversee that team, but we bought Salesforce really early on and made sure we had a really clean data set and knew how we were managing Salesforce, Salesforce knew how, made sure we knew how we were running our sales business. Um, we use sale through for our, um, newsletter system. I would recommend most people like most businesses start on beehive i'm a huge fan um it just made sense for us going this sort of like wide more like enterprise style working with sail through sail through sail through that's what you use to send the newsletter okay that's what we use um we uh use a tool called segment um for like marketing attribution we uh, have been moving from looker to a tool called hex for data visualization um We've used monday.com for project management. We use Notion for, I've loved using Notion, um, even though we use kind of a a combo of Notion and Google Suite. um, Notion has been so flexible and sort of been like the, our internal um, portal for our team. And I think another big one is Rippling. Adam is a big Rippling fanboy, and um, it really is incredible starting a business where you can do everything within one tool, healthcare, reviews, like. You really can do it all in Rippling. They've been a big business inspiration for us as too, for us too. Um, and that they do was a laptop really, administration as well. If you really, they want. sure do. Um, we use it for that as okay, well. So yeah, we yeah. we try to take advantage of as much as, as they have to offer, especially as we've scaled up past like fifty people. And so it just makes life a lot easier, and you don't have to keep adding more nice. and more people. So that's a big one that I recommend to folks as well. Pretty cool. I feel like people grossly underestimate how much administrative cost comes with yeah. running a company that's more than five ten people. Yes, Um, I agree. I definitely underestimated it. (laughs) And I had someone on the other day and he was talking. Have you heard of the book Profit First? Mm -hmm. So you divide your money into like four or five accounts, right? And so his payroll account would always sometimes be short because he's taking out money and segregating. And he was like, the amount of fees I've paid in overdraft protection, because when payroll doesn't hit, you get charged for like every transaction. And that ends up adding up. But it's like these small things that you just like don't account for. And then it could end up being a couple hundred K at the end of the year of just administrative costs of 
not knowing any better, but. Yeah, administrative costs, bringing people, we're really passionate about bringing people together, ideally at least like once a year from the team. Yeah. And it's amazing and so expensive to do. So we love like letting people work remote. People can work from wherever they want. We have a small office here in Austin, but love bringing people together. But it's a huge, huge expense for sure. Yeah. I do this bit where I ask every guest for a last question. So I have a question for you from my previous guest. Okay. And I'll ask you for one for whoever my next guest is. So your question is, uh, what does balance mean to you? Balance. I'll come back to what I've been saying about long time horizons and... There are a million different reasons to build a business and a million different goals people have. And I don't think one is better than the other. I think if you're building an incredible lifestyle business, that's amazing. If you're building a business to flip it and sell it for a bunch of cash, good on you. Um, We're really, our focus has always been, we'd love to build something long lasting over a long period of time. And if we extend our time horizons, instead of thinking on two or three years, how do we think on 10, 15, 20? Um, what could we build? And to do that, it really is a marathon, not a sprint. And so balance to me um, means taking care of myself outside of work as much as I'm putting into my work. Um, And it's just been really powerful to me to invest in like fitness and therapy and friendships and community. Those that like support system outside of work. I have such an amazing community here. Um, and I really do invest time. It's like blocked off on my calendar in the same way that like meetings are in doing those things. And so, yeah, it's me. Balance means like I am a whole person. I'm not just who I am in this this business. And I want it to be successful. And I put a ton of time and energy into it. But I like to put a, a lot of time and energy into those other things so that I can show up as my best self at work. Nice. I like that. What's your question for whoever my next guest is? Yeah, my question for most people is, what do you think the most important part of building a culture is? Or okay. like maybe what do you think is most important in your team's culture on your road to success? And I'm always curious. What okay, pretty cool. Is there something that is exciting you over the next three to six months or something that you're looking forward to? Yeah, we're launching. Um, we started launching these memberships or communities for our brands and we launched two last year and tried kind of two really different versions of it and learned a lot um and so over the next six months we're launching a community for each of our other brands that exists which is really fast and a big effort but also really exciting and it's been just truly so cool to see how the audiences of these newsletters like the right group of people coming together creates such an exciting spark and energy um, in the spaces that they're in. So I'm, I'm really nice. pleased about that. Yeah. Random, just analytical question for my curiosity. Is there a North Star metric you have on a per community basis that allows you to judge the success or growing, like just yeah. the viability of that? Definitely. I mean, the number one metric we're looking at is MRR. Um, but outside of that, the thing that I'm looking most closely at is, um, the ratio of daily active to monthly active users and um, how many people are engaging on the platform every day is really important. And so that for us um, has been really high um, relative to other industry benchmarks lately. And I'm really excited about what kind of experience can we provide and continue providing in this platform to get people there and have them spend their day there, some part of their day there every day. What's the number you want your daily active uh, with respect to monthly active to be? Like, what's that percentage? That- I would love in the near to midterm for that to be like 35% plus. Nice. And we're looking at, we look at weekdays because it's yeah. the yeah, week. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sweet. Um, but that's that's all the questions I had for you. Amazing. Where can we plug you? Where should people reach out? What can we link for you in the description? Yeah. Um, I'm not, <laughs> uh, it's funny, I'm not super active on Twitter, but my Twitter is at Beck Sherm, B E C S H E R M. Maybe I'll step it up here after yeah. getting plugged in this podcast and can also follow everything we're doing at workweek.com. Sweet. And we'll link everything. Is there anything immediate you need, anything that someone listening may be able to help you with? Or mm. we are looking for 
a lead engineer um, okay. to help us come on and continue building out our membership platform as well as integrating that platform across our business. Um, so if anyone has great tech talent, we're looking for that. And what uh, tech stack do you guys use? Do you know? Right now, I believe the data team has been primarily using Ruby on Rails, and that's what they'll be working with the most, um, as well as like WordPress. And then, um, yeah, Ruby and WordPress are the two big ones. Okay, sweet. Hey!